I'm Mark Milkey, Executive Director for the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy. We're a new think tank in Canada devoted to reason, democracy, and civilization. There's a lot under those three categories, uh, and we hope to launch later this year. Uh, this is, uh, the Aristotle Foundation is right now composed of a blue ribbon board and also 20 issues and ideas, advisors, people who will become future senior fellows. Our intent is to focus on Canadian issues under that uh, broad heading of reason, democracy, and civilization, including examples such as race and incomes, democratic norms, or civilizational issues, one of which we'll discuss today, crime. There is a charitable application underway. Uh, we're hopeful on that, and we do, as I mentioned a moment ago, hope to launch later this year or in early 2023. If you'd like to look at our website, it is www.aristotlefoundation.org. AristotleFoundation.com will also take you there. Make sure you look for the Canadian version. There are other similar name, similarly named institutes and think tanks out there, but AristotleFoundation.org. Before our real launch, though, um, later this year, we are previewing some of the topics, some of the approaches we're going to take. One bit of work we want to do regularly is something called interviews with a contrarian. And uh, this is an interview series we've started. Uh, my last one, my last interview is with Waller Newell, professor at Carleton. I'll introduce today's guest in a moment. And today the issue is going to be about crime. Now, crime and crime policy should matter for what should be obvious reasons. Crime can affect us deeply. Um, one of the statistics out of the books that we'll talk about today from Professor Barry Latzer, who I'll introduce in a moment here. Uh, one of the statistics I noticed in, his, in one of his books is, I think the most recent one, is that four out of 10 homicides are never cleared. Uh, so obviously crime has an impact on our lives, our daily lives, uh, and sometimes consequentially so, even, even uh, permanently. And civilized societies obviously need smart approaches to crime. Civilization is a word that's perhaps out of fashion today. It shouldn't be. Um, we all live under the umbrella uh, of civilization. So with that introduction, let me now introduce Professor Barry Latzer, JD PhD, Professor Emer Emeritus of Criminal Justice at John Jay College uh, at the City University of New York. Professor Latzer has taught courses on criminal justice, criminal law and procedure, state constitutional law, capital punishment, and most recently, crime history. Professor Latzer has written and published five books and approximately 90 scholarly articles, as well as research reports, magazine articles, uh, book reviews, and op-eds. His scholarly work has been published in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, the Journal of Criminal Justice, Judicature, Judge's Journal, Criminal Law Bulletin, and major law reviews. Other writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Daily Beast, National Review, the Chronicle of Higher Education, City Journal, the Law and Liberty website, the New York Post, and the New York Daily News. Now, for Canadians, uh, we will be familiar with this name in particular. A widely read interview was conducted with David Frum and appeared in The Atlantic uh, back in 2016 with Dr. Latzer. Professor Latzer received his PhD from the University of Massachusetts in 1977 and a law degree from Fordham University in 1985. His BA is from Brooklyn College in 1966. You don't look old enough to have graduated in 1966, Barry. Thanks, Mark. He briefly served as an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn in 1985-1986 and was, an, was a counsel to indigent, indigent criminal defendants in Manhattan in 1986 and 1987. Uh, perhaps we can ask uh, whether he knew Rudolph Giuliani at the time in a moment. Now, his most recent books relevant to uh, today's conversation, The Rise and Fall of Violent Crime in 2016, The Roots of Violent Crime in America from the Gilded Age to the Great Depression 2020, which I've mostly finished reading and was an enjoyable read, um, an, an informative read, fascinating read, actually. And The Myth of Overpunishment, which has just been released by Republic Book Publishers, the subtitle is A Defense of the American Justice System and a Proposal to Reduce Incarceration While Protecting the Public. That's the myth of overpunishment just released, just in the warehouse, just getting to all of the usual bookstores and online bookstores right now. So um, Contrarian is an appropriate uh, title of the series and also for Professor Latzer, given the title of his newest book, The Myth of Overpunishment. So welcome, Professor Latzer. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm delighted to be with you. Today, let's go through, maybe maybe we'll split this up into sort of three sections, um, or at least progress this way. Uh, and if we take a rabbit trail, that's fine. First, I want to ask you why people commit crimes. We'll get a discussion going there. Um, 
There are various reasons, of course, and claims. And then uh, some of the myths about uh, why people uh, commit crimes. And I'm thinking here of your 2020 book on this subject, um, especially violent crimes and in your explanation of cultural uh, explanations. And then third, drawing on your new book, uh, The Myth of, of Overpunishment, where we can ex explore past and present uh, approaches to crime policy. But let's start with the first question, um, Barry. Why do people commit crimes? Uh, some people have monocausal explanations. I don't think that's your position. Why, why do people commit crimes that most people agree are crimes? Uh, mm -hmm. Not say, you know, a tyrant that outlaws personal criticism, but crimes that we all are unfortunately maybe familiar with robbery, mm. um, you know, violent sexual assault, murder, the rest of it. Yes, yes. Um, most analysts, Mark, will divide this into reasons that cause uh, an individual to commit crime versus more general causes that impact on, on groups. So you have group behavior. Uh, people trained in psychology will look at the individual causes people trained as I am in sociology will look at the group causes. So if you're looking at individual causes, you would look at the motivations that affect a person who commits crime. So let's say he's uh, very angry at somebody and he's easily uh, drawn to violence. Uh, and then he assaults or even kills the target of his uh, animus. In this situation, we could say uh, anger and, and maybe a, a, a quickness to anger and an inability to control his anger is the cause of the criminal act. And that would not be incorrect. It would be correct. But it wouldn't be the kind of thing I'll be looking at because I'm interested in the sociological analysis. So I'm interested in group behaviors. Why do some groups, as we define them, of course, uh, and, and that in itself is a subject for discussion, uh, why do some groups commit more crime than other groups? And even there, uh, we could slice this in different ways. Um, we could look, for instance, at general conditions in a, in a nation, in a country. And we can ask, uh, well, if you have an economic depression, is that a cause of crime, generally speaking? Uh, if you have a, a boom, an economic boom, does that retard criminality? So you can ask it that way. And I do ask that question too, both of those, in fact. And by the way, the answer is that there's no consistent response to general economic conditions for violent crime. Um, now that's, let, but, let me interject for a moment. Sure, please. That's, that's interesting because these days there seems to be regression, if I can put it that way, back to this monocausal or root, root causes argument that if only um, you could get most people more prosperous, uh, and in fact, this seems to be happening anyway with the recovery from COVID, and the pandemic and, and the reactions to it. Uh, nonetheless, we also have a rise in crime. So, but there is this explanation, perhaps more among progressives, that that uh, crime is a result of poverty. And uh, if you can right. make, if you you can eliminate that, these root causes they like to think, or racism in other cases, so right. on and so forth, that you will eliminate, or at least you know, uh, you will uh, dampen crime. Um, yes. So there, there's no consistent uh, data that shows poverty a la 1930s or some recession necessarily leads to an uptick in crime. Right. Let's let's just limit our discussion to violent crime. And that's sort sure. of waiting it, Mark, because sure. if we were talking about theft, we might have a very different answer. OK. If people are desperate uh, in a time of, of a serious depression, they might well in, in, uh, enact uh, carry out uh, more thefts than than usual, even to to supply their most basic needs. So that wouldn't surprise us. But let's take the violent crimes, which is generally defined by the criminologist as, as murder and manslaughter would be included in the murder because whether it's murder or manslaughter is a judicial decision, a court decision. Um, robbery, assault, usually meaning 
very serious assault, felony level uh, assault. And what did I leave out? Uh, oh, and sexual attacks, rapes. So those four crimes would be considered the main violent crimes. You could add more, kidnapping, for instance. Um, but usually those four are considered the mainstay. Now, your question, and 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 I get this question all the time, it's, an, it's really an excellent question, is, is there any correlation between the four crimes I just named, violent crimes, and general economic conditions? The answer is no. How do I know this? <laughs> because let's take the Great Depression in the United States, and of course it smashed Canada too. This was a global depression. Your years may have been a little different. I'm not sure of that. But anyway, here, uh, it started with, with the Wall Street crash in 29. But the really the apogee, the worst period was 31, 32. And, and, uh, and those years were the worst. And then it bounced back again. That is, things went <laughs> down and hill again in 37, 38. So what I did is very simple. I, I plotted violent crimes. Murder is our most accurate one. And I plotted the, the, let's say, unemployment rate during the Great Depression years. And what did I find? No consistent pattern. In 31, 32, indeed, crime was very high. Violent crime was extremely high. But in 37, 38, crime was, down, was going down. It was, uh, it was on a downturn. So here we have two serious uh, economic depression periods. In one case, crime was going up, in the other, it's going down. The same happened in 2007, 8, 9, another uh, what we call here in the States the Great Recession, right? Another serious recessionary period. Violent crime was going down the whole time during this uh, very bad economic downturn. So there's no, and, and I could cite other recessions, and it's the same point. There's no consistent relationship between violent crime and economic downturns, or upturns for that matter. So this brings out other possible explanations then for why the crime increases, which I find fascinating, especially from uh, the book that I, that I did finish off. Um, you know, your, your 2020 book on, on violent crime and history of it in the United yes. States. This, of course, is applicable to Canada because we often have some of the, we have very similar trends and often Canadian policy in, and governments react to what's happened in the United States positively or negatively or use the United States um, as a reason to do something or not do something. Um, so what, what else would would cause a rise in violent crime. I'm particularly fascinated again by the explanation you given the roots of violent crime in America from the Gilded Age to the Great Depression, because you bring in some of these other factors we often don't hear about today, such as culture. So can you explain uh, for our viewers a little bit more um, about you know, the role of culture in crime? And in fact, let's dive deeply into you know, this issue today. You, because of the rise of Black Lives Matter, and, uh, you know, the murder uh, two years ago, uh, uh, you know, of uh, Derek Floyd. Jordan, by, George Floyd. Yeah. Um, and uh, the resultant conviction of, of murder in that case. Um, there is this notion that um, violent crime, uh, you know, historically has a lot to do with uh, racism, institutional racism and the rest of it. Uh, but mm -hmm. what I found interesting in The Roots of Violent Crime in America, your 2020 book, is that you trace this all the way back to Great Britain. Uh, the cultural roots of crime in the United States. And in fact, um, I mean, let's, uh, you know, uh, go to, you know, where, where people often don't think about, I mean, there is this argument um, historically that black crime rates are higher in the American South, higher in the rest of the United States. The data seems to bear that out. But what you do is you go back one step further and say, yes, but where did this, where did they uh, get this pattern of crime from? And you yes. have white, whites in the American South, and in fact, you trace it back to Great Britain. Can you explain yes. what you found there? Because I find this cultural explanation for crime and where it started mm. um, in the American South and before that across the Atlantic, uh, fascinating. Mm, mm, mm. Just one point before I get there, so we don't lose the economic issue, because I, I think okay. you'll find it interesting. And then we'll definitely explore the cultural question, which is probably the most controversial okay. point I make. In, in my book and in my other books as well. Okay. Um, but but just to, to draw nail down the the, the economic issue, uh, Mark. Um, so one reason 
I think the main reason that crime and, and that violent crime and, and economic conditions don't follow a consistent pattern is the motivation for the individual in violent crime. The motivation is usually, and it's in the case of of assault and murder, at least, the motivation is anger, anger at some other person uh, who uh, may have threatened him in some way, dissed him, insulted him in some way, uh, uh, threatened to take his girlfriend away, belittled him, humiliated him, and it's anger at this, or it could be a long-standing grudge between them too. Mm. It's anger at this that leads to the assault or the murder. So we're looking there at an individual's motivation, an individual uh, a cause. But when you think about that, why should there be more anger and uh, therefore assault when there's an economic downturn? No reason, they're not related which is exactly why there's no relationship between economic downturns and, and rises in, in violent crime. Because sure, they're not you're, really you're saying you're, you're, uh, wouldn't the argument be if you saw an uptick in violent crime during a recession or a Great Depression, mm -hmm. you'd say, well, obviously they're, you know, they've got some needs, they're obviously frustrated, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but you're saying because there's no correlation uh, between the rise no. or decrease in violent crime, we've got to look elsewhere. Yes. Now, Two exceptions, rape and robbery. Uh, rape, because it's usually motivated by, by sexual desire, and that's debatable. People say it's motivated. Some people say it's motivated by a desire to, to control or assert power over women. But it, if there's no sexual, if there's no sexual desire involved, it's not going to be rape or attempted rape. There has to be some sexual involvement for that crime to occur. The other one that's tricky is robbery, because robbery is defined, I'm sure in Canada as well, as a combination of, of theft and violence, a violent threat or an actual violent act combined with the theft, the taking of the, of the valuable property. So because it's a, it's a hybrid of, of uh, theft and violence, it might be affected by economic downturns. You can imagine, for instance, if there's an economic downturn and more people are down at the heels, you can imagine they might resort to more robberies to obtain what they don't have. So robbery could be affected by economic downturns, but not assault, not murder. We know this because we see, as I said, the inconsistent uh, pattern. Now I wanna swing to the group question that you raised, the cultural question. Unless you want to jump in. And, no, and, well, because it's it's a nice segue to it, because then, yeah, the um, question is, what else, you know, wh why do murder rates increase or decrease? And does this yes. have something to do with cultural, you know, norms, expectations, behaviors that are yes. you know, discouraged yes. or encouraged or tolerated? So yes. I'm fascinated by this cultural explanation, which yes. you give in yes. one of your books. So uh, culture is the, the beliefs and actions of people who consider themselves a group, consider themselves different in some way from other people. And th the group definition could be based on religion. Uh, it could be based on, on race. It doesn't, certainly doesn't uh, have to be. Uh, it certainly could be based on ethnicity. If you're from a particular uh, country and you immigrate to the United States or, or, or to Canada. So these different ways of defining groups are generally accepted, not really controversial. Then we say groups have different cultures. And we mean by this religious differences, differences in the kinds of clothing they wear, differences in the kind of food they eat, differences in religion. And we can make a very long list of, of the differences. And when you think about it, those differences define the group. They make what we consider a separate group of people from other people in the society. So I think that's pretty foundational. I don't think it's very controversial. The controversial part is when one says, as I do say, that some groups have subcultures, smaller groupings within the group that engage in 
great amounts relative to others of violence. Now that's controversial. To me, it's obvious. <laughs> it's been true forever and it's obvious, but it's controversial. It's especially controversial, of course, when you're dealing with racial groups. Now, a racial group is not the same as a cultural group. You could have black people from Haiti. You could have black people from Western Africa. They're racially in, indistinguishable from other black people, but culturally very distinguishable from one another. Very distinguishable. What do I mean? Simple. They have maybe linguistic differences religious differences, dietary differences, and you can go on down the list. So they're racially alike, but culturally different. And for me, the key is culture, not race. And I want to stress that because people will say, well, this Latzer, you know, he's, I just lost a friend. He said, you're a borderline racist. Hmm. I mean, can you, can you give us a clear example of the not difference? racism? Yeah. Um, can you give us a clear example of the difference in culture? So, I mean, I'm thinking of St. Thomas versus Haiti. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a difference in culture there. Um, and I would assume in crime rates in the two jurisdictions and, and immigrants to the United States and Canada uh, and, and the like. Uh, am I wrong? Or is that, a, is that the example you, one could give, Haiti versus St. Thomas? I'm sorry, Saint, when you say St. Thomas. I'm, I'm thinking of the, um, what is it, the... Um, you know, uh, the uh, what do you what do you call the islands that, uh, you know, are uh, ah. decorates of the United States? I think it's St. Thomas, if I'm not mistaken, U.S. U.S. Virgin Islands, the rest of it. OK, uh, OK, sorry. Yeah, I was uh, a little remiss on my Caribbean islands there. Yeah, sure. There are differences and we can we can track them and study them. Sure. Of course, there are differences. Right. These but that's what you mean are... by cultural difference, as opposed to when the majority population is, you know, one skin color. Obviously, yeah. there's nothing else happening. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to absolutely. do with color. Obviously, it has to do with culture and beliefs and practice. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In 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 my uh, 2016 book, the Rise and Fall book, I have a section there on the Haitian boat people, as we call them, people who illegally immigrated and usually went to Miami, hmm. because it was a fascinating case study for me, Mark. I looked at the uh, violent crime rates of the Haitians in Miami and the violent crime rates of African-Americans who were already in Miami. The Haitian violent crime rate was much lower, but they're just as black. Right. They were not only right. just as black, but they were discriminated against. They were disliked by the population already there. They were not welcome at all. And despite that, their violent crime rates were lower than the African-American violent crime rates in the same city. Okay. in the same place. So can you trace this yeah, illustrates sorry, cultural differences. Can you trace this back now? Because I found the discussion, yes, in the roots of violent crime in America from 2020, again, fascinating where um, there is this, it's clear the data shows that, you know, uh, you know, black populations in the American South are um, were historically more violent than say, initially uh, black populations in the Northern United States. Yes. Um, but then as migration rates to the North changed, that changed as well. What was right. interesting, of course, is that this is not a, a Black issue. Um, necessarily, it started with white uh, Southerners and the intestines so. that was, as we mentioned a moment ago, uh, the United Kingdom. Can you explain that? Because I think that helps bring out again this notion that there are cultural attitudes that seem to influence yes. groups or sub cohorts of those groups. As yes. opposed to, I mean, the racists, racists, you know, historically would say there's something genetically or whatever. Uh, right. They would blame people based on skin color. What you're saying is very different. That no, look, look into the cultural assumptions in cohort X versus cohort Y. So, can you yes. tell us a little bit more about um, how crime rates in the American South came to be by starting uh, several centuries ago uh, with your look into what was happening in the United Kingdom uh, on the border, yes. especially between Scotland and England? Yes, yes, it's fascinating. Uh, I didn't discover this, historians discovered it, and the historians pointed out that there were different migrations to the United States uh, from the UK, it wasn't the UK yet, uh, and, and these different migrant groups, these are whites now, of course, uh, had uh, different propensities to violence. And uh, the group from Eastern England, and I guess Southern England, uh, tended to be nonviolent. And they ended up migrating to New England. 
But the groups from the borderlands between Scotland and England, which were apparently pretty brutal and untamed, they ended up migrating first to Pennsylvania, to the, to the Appalachian Mountains, and then down into the South. And this group was quite violent, very violent. And they already exhibited what historians later called an honor culture, where you have a great sensitivity to perceived insults and a propensity to use violence in response to these perceived insults. If this sounds familiar, just read Thomas Sowell's uh, books on uh, African-American behavior. And of course, I picked this up from Sowell. So we have these Southerners who originally came from the borderlands between Scotland and England, who were quite violent, much more violent than the other immigrants from, from England. And they end up in the South, in Georgia and Virginia and South Carolina, et cetera. And what time period now, are, we, are we talking about, Barry? So the period now is from the uh, 1600s, 1700s, really, it's 17, more, more 1700s, 18th century. Uh, and, and then we can move into the next century after the United States becomes a, a country. And now, of course, we have a big increase in the slave population. And where is this slave population? It's all in the South. 90% of that population lived in the South up until 1910, up until the 20th century, when the Great Migration, as it was called, as it is called, uh, took place. So it should come as no surprise that the African-American population tended to absorb a lot of the cultural characteristics of the white Southerners because they lived amongst them for 200 years, 300 years. And so they absorb as well this honor culture, as the historians call it, this sensitivity to insults and slight, and most important, this propensity to use violence in response. So my argument is that the black population sort of absorbs from the Southern white population, this cultural propensity to violence. Now this happens mostly with people who are in the low income brackets. And this is another fascinating insight, I think. If you move up to the middle class, as we call it, if you move up to a more affluent position in society, you're gonna eschew violence. You're not gonna go out and rob banks unless you're psychotic. I mean, who would do such a thing? If you and I did that, we'd be caught, we'd be in prison, we'd lose our jobs, we'd lose our families, we'd lose our reputation, we'd lose everything. So we'd be complete fools to engage in violence. So middle income people don't engage, and upper income people, more affluent people don't engage in violence because you would risk everything, everything that you've gained in, in, in life to do so that. Is it a combination? But lower income people will engage in, in violence. So and, and that's why income is a, a, a factor in, in criminal behavior. So is, is it a combination of culture plus income? So economics plus culture in some cases. I mean, the quote you have in the book, in The Roots of Violent Crime in America, yes. is white violence remains high in the early 20th century, in the 20th century, not due to poverty, urbanization, slavery, uh, was it slavery, uh, but redneck culture. Um, among whites, I think, well, you're talking about white violence, so it's not slavery. Yes. Um, not due to poverty, or urbanization, but redneck culture. Yes. So, um, so this again is where so we're lower income, and this is the what the stereotypical, uh, you know, view of the Appalachians and you know um, what you know the the feuds that have gone on there, mm -hmm. uh, you know the the famous feuds in in uh, you know popular literature and the rest of it, yes, and movies. So it is this is uh, explain a little bit more about redneck culture. So it's a combination of what economic circumstances plus this southern culture of of honor in quotes and violence that has uh, continued all the way from what the 16th 1700s still yes yeah, i mean you, very recently you, you covered it yourself you covered it beautifully that redneck culture is just a name another name for this honor culture it's a i guess a more 20th century term 
for, for this honor culture among, among uh, whites. Now it's dissipating in, in the South uh, as whites move to the middle class, as they become more affluent, you find this less and less. You don't have to go into the hills and, and, and you know, in the more impoverished areas, uh, the trailer uh, trash areas, as right. they insultingly call them. And you're going to find higher violent crime rates in those areas. So, yes, this redneck culture is the same thing as the honor culture. That's the old honor culture is the old fashioned word for it. Right. Now, to pick up the threat. So we have African-Americans sort of absorbing this this violent culture. And by the way, almost all the victims of their violence are are other blacks. For, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, birds of a feather. People tend to hang out with their own kind, as we say, and they tend to quarrel with their own kind as well. Second of all, if blacks attacked whites down south, they would face the, the lynch rope, and, and that's a good disincentive to, to refrain from and attacking. Again, sorry, the period whites. we're talking about is post Civil War, antebellum, and until the 1920s, 1930s, or Correct. longer. Okay. Correct. Absolutely right. That's the time frame. That is the time frame. So now what happens? We have Blacks absorbing this honor culture. Uh, as Soul called them, they're Black rednecks. I, I wish I had thought of that. Black rednecks, by which he means, of course, this same honor culture, this same propensity to, to use violence, uh, except unlike the, the white rednecks, they're Black rednecks. But of course, they've inherited, so to speak, this, these attitudes and values from the white Southerners. Now, the migration north comes. And this happens in the 20th century, largely for economic reasons. They can make much more money and, and get better jobs up north in factories. And they need the labor in the factories. They're desperate for labor. And when in the United States, we started curtailing foreign immigration in the 1920s, then the black workers became even more valuable to, to the factory owners who were, as I said, desperate for labor. So blacks migrate north. And guess what they take with them? Uh, they take their culture with them, of course, soul food, jazz, positive things, right? But also, unfortunately, this propensity to use violence when someone feels that he's insulted, when someone is offended. And it's the perception, of course, of the actor that counts, whether it's objectively true or not, is, is completely irrelevant. So they take this violent culture up north. Now, notice racism really doesn't have much to do with this. But racism enters in in this way. Racism, by which I mean racial discrimination, overt in this case, keeps Blacks from advancing up the socioeconomic ladder. It keeps them subordinate. It keeps them impoverished, right? So now you have the class that commits the violent crimes, the low-income class, kept in that position up until the 1960s, really, kept in the subordinate economic position. Or to put it differently, the lower class is kept in the lower class because of racism, right? So the, the irony of this is, of course, this perpetuates the high black crime rates, which involve violent crime. Now, again, I'm, ro robbery's in a different case, rape is in a different case, theft is in a different case, but the assault and the murder, and we're st seeing them still in places like Chicago with black gangs, right? These things begin in this way, historically speaking. Let me follow up that thread a little bit with um, with a question, because um, again, and we'll get to your your new book in a moment here as well. I want to I want to segue to there in a little bit. Um, but in the roots of violent crime in America, you mention or are you compare it. I don't have the statistic in front of me where before the the Great Migration up north by by black Southerners. I think you compared crime rates of, of Black Americans in some of the, the major northern cities to white crime in the American South, and white crime, violent crime, is much higher. And it so is. again, to make the point vis-a-vis, -vis, say, you know, the racists of the day or since, uh, 
that no, this is not, you know, this is not about race. This is really, again, about cultural norms, beliefs, and the rest of it um, in a particular group or its, its, its sub cohort or its cohort, rather, sub cohort. So what, uh, remind me of which statistics, again, where you show, again, certain in Northern cities of lower crime rates among black Americans in those cities, vis-a-vis -vis white Southerners. Um, I don't have those statistics at hand either, Mark. I'm sorry, but uh, but there are instances of that, and I can remember in the studies in Philadelphia, um, uh, I'm forgetting the the name of the author now. But anyway, those studies show that when Italians migrated to Philadelphia, they had higher rates of violent crime than the African Americans were in Philadelphia. So here's here's an illustration of, of, of the point. And today, if you talk about high Italian violent crime rates, people think of the mafia movies, right? They, you know, that's so separate from reality, right? That yes. uh, we have to fall back on, on uh, Hollywood uh, films because the circumstances have changed. So, um, so the white violent crime rates throughout the 20th century uh, uh, up until World War II are, are quite high. And they're uh, roughly on a par with the black violent crime rates. But the black violent crime rates really grow exponentially when they move to Northern cities. Why is that? Probably because there's a greater sense of freedom for blacks up North. And also probably because there are more things of value to obtain up North robbery becomes more tempting, <coughs> excuse me, up north. And, uh, and also because the rural uh, south uh, is not really a place to, that invites a lot of robberies. It, it just doesn't. Uh, and the robbery rates are low down south, but the interpersonal violence is quite high. Uh, so, that's really the the essence of this cultural uh, argument. And uh, again, it, it's not the same as a race uh, argument. I'm not claiming anything is biologically determined here. I, in fact, I totally repudiate that uh, that kind of thinking. Uh, I, I don't agree with it. I don't accept it. I don't think it's proven and I don't think it's true. So uh, I reject it. But I do think cultural, uh, the cultural argument uh, is, is valid. I do think it has a, a powerful explanatory value. I think, uh, let's, let's pick that up there and then let's move to your new book. The, okay. the, the and I, I understand what you're saying or hear what you're saying. There is an argument these days that to simply point out differences between groups or cohorts and, and uh, statistics is itself racist. I mean, this is the Ibram X. Kendi argument, right? That to, to identify any differences between groups um, is racist and or the cause of, of differences between groups must be due to racism, institutional racism, or what have you, as opposed mm -hmm. to, no, there may be other factors, uh, geography, yeah. um, you know, yeah. culture in this case, as we've been talking about, or economics. Yeah. Right? Well, all uh, I'll say is this, Mark, if you can't study group behaviors, then criminology is out of business because it's all going to be psychology instead, which is, as I said at the opener, certainly valid for explaining individual behavior. I'm not saying it's not valid, but if you want to explain, uh, criminology relies on group behavior. If they can't discuss group behavior, then they're out of business. They really are out of business. Good point. Just a reminder to our viewers, I'm talking with Barry Latzer, uh, Professor Emeritus of Criminology, is it again, Barry, at the City University of New York. And we're talking about a number of his books, uh, there are three of them, The Rise and Fall of Violent Crime in America, published in 2016, The Roots of Violent Crime in America, From the Gilded Age to the Great Depression, published in 2020. We've been looking at that. Let's turn, though, Barry, to your third book, The Myth of Overpunishment, just out in the stores now. And uh, it's got one of those long subtitles. It's almost 19th century in its subtitles. A Defense <laughs> of the American Justice System and a Proposal to Reduce Incarceration While Protecting the Public, uh, as I mentioned, just released now. Let's go into that because um, you talk about the myth of overpunishment. So what yeah. is the myth? Well, I don't have to tell your listeners and viewers that everyone is worried about mass incarceration. At least everyone on, on the left side of the spectrum is worried about mass incarceration. 
And this book really is an examination of punishment historically in the United States. And that morphs into a discussion of mass incarceration. I think there's been some gross exaggeration about mass incarceration. Uh, two, two big points, two big takeaways here. If you look at the number of offenses, and we have very uh, good ways of measuring the number of offenses. If you look at the number of offenses and the number of people punished, you're gonna see a huge gap, a huge gap. Why? Because some offenses, some crimes are not reported to the police. So many are reported to the police and the police never apprehend the perpetrator. And finally, and especially most recently, perpetrator may be ap apprehended, but he's not punished. And in the US, we have these so-called woke prosecutors who think that's a virtue, not punishing people, especially people who commit relatively minor offenses. So if you look in terms of the number of people punished versus the number of crimes committed, there's an appalling gap how do we know these crimes are committed? Well, two ways, principally, without relying on the police, because some people say, well, the police are biased or the police only go into, uh, you know, race areas, racially distinctive areas. Uh, so you can't go by the police. So we won't go by the police. Uh, in the US, though, we keep records on people who are killed. We have very good records on, on, uh, on homicide. Homicide is when one human being kills another human being. It may not be a crime, but it's still a homicide. So we have very good records on homicide. We know how many people are killed by other human beings, by assault, essentially, by other human beings. Those records are very accurate. So we, even though we may not have a lot of people convicted of murder, we know how many people are killed by other humans. We know how many homicide victims there are. So that's one great way of measuring crime. The second important way is through surveys of crime victims. And every year, the Census Bureau in the United States interviews almost 100,000 households and asks people if they've been victimized by crime. Now, the, the people being interviewed have no stake in fabricating and making up things and telling uh, stories to the interviewers. So this is another accurate way of determining how much crime there is. So that's how we know how much crime there is without even relying on the criminal justice system as, as a measure. And is this where so you the get first the statistics point, that four out of ten homicides are never cleared, and two thirds of rapes and rape rapes and, and robberies are never yeah. never cleared either? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's valid. That's valid. But now that's on the that's on the police. We have to assume. Well, rapes may not always be reported, but uh, nor robberies at times either. But the murders will be. We know about the murders because there are people missing. Dead bodies are found. We know about homicides. That's our most accurate crime statistic. We know about homicides. So we can say four out of 10 homicides are never cleared by your police. So the, the, first, the first point of this then is when you look at all the people punished with incarceration and you look at the number of crimes that occur, huge gap. It's a big gap. So how can it be mass incarceration if we're not punishing lots of people who've committed crimes? Second point, are we punishing those that we do apprehend and convict and sentence to prison? Are we giving them extremely long sentences? The answer is some of them are getting long sentences and maybe you can argue some of these sentences are way too long, Mark. But you can't look at the sentences. You have to look at the time they actually serve. 80% of the people who are sent to prison, not just not jail where they spend just a few days, but prison, 80% of those are released before their sentences are fully served. So in order to determine how much punishment there is, 
we have to look at the, what we call the time served, the time actually served by people in prison. And in my book, The Myth of Overpunishment, I break down by crime the number of years actually served. And I think there'll be some uh, eyebrows raised by this, Mark. As you would expect, murderers serve the most time, about 15 years. But people who do robberies serve two or three years. People who do drug crimes serve about a year. So the time served is actually low relative to what the crimes are. And therefore, if you're going to talk about mass incarceration, you're going to have to take into account that not only do we have a lot of crimes for which the accountable people are never caught or punished, but the ones who are caught and punished aren't punished very harshly. Again, you can't just look at sentences. You have to look at time served. So isn't the, um, isn't the objection, or to play devil's advocate these days, I think the objection, though, is that, first of all, there's a greater proportion of ex-minority in the prison system, Black Americans mm -hmm. in the case of the United mm -hmm. States, Indigenous Canadians in the case of Canada, uh, mm -hmm. would be the, the corresponding statistic up here. Um, so there's that. And there's also this notion, though, that governments, though, since what, since Ronald Reagan down south in your country, and uh, I don't know, the policies changed dramatically up here. In fact, you, you make a note in, in one of your books that they didn't, actually. There wasn't quite the tough on crime policies up here. But actually, mm -hmm. during the Harper years, there's some of this argument as well. It came from Conrad Black, the famous newspaper proprietor, and, and uh, who himself spent some time in American prison. Um, but he, he would argue during the Harper years that there was a more tough on crime approach, maybe akin to Ronald Reagan's approach on the war on drugs in the 1980s. So there is this notion out there that somehow governments in both countries, perhaps at different periods, became much tougher on crime, sentences mm -hmm. became longer. I know you're not familiar with the Canadian statistics, but in the American context, that would be the argument that you threw all these people in jail for smoking dope, right? Or that, yeah. that sort of argument. You're, yeah. you're saying that's not necessarily the case from the statistics. We did toughen up, but there was a huge uh, weakening of the criminal justice system at the end of the 1960s when crime began to escalate. Nobody discusses that. Mm. You had this tremendous, uh, really uh, co almost collapse of the American criminal justice system, which I demonstrate because I can compare the number of people who were imprisoned for each crime in, say, 1970 versus number of people in prison for each crime in 1960. And you could see the difference. There's a huge difference. So the system is in near collapse. It's being overwhelmed, really, by the, by the big upturn in crime. And this is not discussed. And that's one of the big motivators for toughening up the system. It did toughen up. It did become more punitive. There's, there's no question about it. But it was coming from a very low point in terms of punitiveness in the late 1960s. And the people, relative to earlier, relative to earlier, the 1950s. Yeah, the yeah, 1960s. relative to earlier and, and certainly relative to later, too. So it was coming from a, lo a low ebb, really, and, and therefore needed to be built up. Plus, the buildup was effective. Most serious analysts conclude that the buildup of imprisonment actually did reduce uh, crime. Uh, so, you know, th that's, that's my answer. That's the, the third point, I guess I would make, that the buildup was effective and it came because crime was rising while the system was flabby. The system was very weak here. Uh, uh, police arrested fewer people. Fewer people were punished when they were arrested. The sentences were lighter when they had sentences imposed. So the system needed to be toughened up. It needed to be juiced. Now, what the opponents will say, two things they'll say. They'll say, well, when crime was going down in the mid-1990s, the system was still exceptionally punitive. That's true. Actually, that, that's a, a fair criticism. But what they don't say is that in a few years later, the, the uh, in the incarceration rate started to go down and they went down consistently for an entire decade and they're still going down. So they leave that part out. Which is where Why the myth, is that? This, so this is where you're unlike Canada, the myth of overpunishment occurs, right? Yeah. Unlike Canada, 
unlike Canada, and, and, and I don't know how much of your criminal justice policy making is devolved to, to uh, each, uh, well, you don't have states, but uh, the provinces. equivalent of, of, yeah. of, of states, prov provinces in, in, in Canada. But here in the US, a lot of the criminal justice uh, policy making is at the state and local level. So to turn things around, to either toughen them up or, or start softening them up, you have to rely on states changing their policies, 50 of them. So it could be a slow process. And it takes some time. It took time to build up from, I would say, the late 60s when crime starts to rise to the, at least the middle 70s when the system starts to toughen up. And it took time to soften from the middle 90s till about the turn of the 21st century. So that's why things take take a, a, a little more time here in, in, in the uh, US. But if it weren't for that buildup, we probably could never have gotten a good control o over the, the violent crime problem in this country. So, um, and has there been a reversal as of late? Because it seems, again, maybe I'm thinking of the petty crime examples from California, which you don't deal with by and large. But even violent crime uh, in the past several years, actually, as I recall, there has been an increase in violent crime and murders in, say, Chicago, the south side in the of last Chicago. couple of years. Yeah. New York has gone up as well. Yes. Uh, so, again, is, is this, are you arguing this is due in part to actually um, this myth um, that, that somehow we've been, uh, you know, your country in particular has been harsh. And in fact, it's going in the reverse direction for some time. And is, you're arguing that's the cause of, of uh, you know, current rise in violent crime in particular? The softening of the system, the, the uh, demoralization of the police, the resignations of, of the police because of that demoralization and the difficulty of recruiting more police, COVID, which made the police reluctant to interact mm. as much, at least in a proactive way, demonstrations, which devoted, diverted the police uh, from uh, uh, crime patrol to demonstration patrol, uh, all of these factors, I think, have contributed to the to the rise in crime. And finally, these these prosecutors who say uh, that if you commit uh, low level crimes, I'm not going to prosecute at all, which means, of course, the police won't arrest. So um, let's do a comparison. Then. Can you give me an example? Because you were around in the mid 1980s and I think you served, you said, as uh, you served in was, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, you live in New Jersey now, but you're in the greater New York area. Can you give me an example of how, say, a crime might be handled now um, in New York City versus, say, you know, after Rudolph Giuliani became mayor and William Bratton was police commissioner and the broken windows theory started to be yeah. put into effect? And we can get into, OK, did broken windows, you know, cause any decrease in crime or not? Or was mm -hmm. it simply... Mm -hmm you know, parallel to what was already going to happen, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But I'm curious, can you give me the, our, our viewers a clear example of how would a crime, a possible crime now in 2022 be handled in New York City or some other city you're familiar with vis-a-vis -vis 1995, 1997, yeah. really at the height of, say, broken windows theory being imposed in New York City? Yeah. Well, you have low-level crimes, misdemeanors, or as they call them in New York City, if they're at a lower level of violations. So you have low level crimes and you have, uh, for instance, the new prosecutor in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, who uh, firmly believes that it's his job to reduce incarceration, including jail, not just prison. And how do you reduce that? Well, you don't prosecute these misdemeanors and these violations. So let's take an example, uh, jumping the turnstile uh, and going into the subway, free ride. Um, well, uh, if you don't prosecute it, it's not going to be a shock to anybody that you're going to get a lot more jumping of the turnstiles. But B Mr. Bragg thinks that, that, that those people should not be arrested, they should not be prosecuted, they should not be jailed. And of course, the, the jail will only be probably for a few days anyway. These are not harshly punished, even in good times. But if there's no punishment at all, and there's a perception that it's really, you know, totally hands off, the police are not going to bother you at all, well, then you'll get more and more of it. So the whole idea of Bratton uh, 
the police commissioner in New York uh, under Giuliani, uh, and then he did a second stint, uh, was to pursue these low-level crimes, on, partly on the broken windows theory, which was that if you pursue low-level crimes, you'll create an atmosphere where you'll diminish much more serious crimes. Frankly, I, I'm not sure that is valid to tell you the truth, but what you will get is reduced and diminished disorder in your city. And I think that's just as important or almost as important anyway as the, as the serious crime. Reducing disorder is very important. Uh, whether it reduces more serious crime or not, it's important to do. Seems like an issue of fairness, too. Uh, is it not? I mean, for the average citizen who does pay to go through the turnstile on the New York subway, seeing someone jump over and basically give a finger to the system uh, and not pay their, their share, uh, pay for their fare, um, that's got to annoy, to, to put it mildly, uh, you know, the, the other citizens of the city who, who do pay, right? And it does seem to, I mean, what's the justification for this? I mean, either why not just take the laws off the book if you're not going to enforce even these, uh, you know, what, what some people might call minor violations. I mean, if, if the prosecutors and others are really serious about this. So what is the justification they give? I mean, you know, is it a capacity thing? Look, we can't prosecute everybody who jumps a turnstile. Um, I mean, is that it? Um, no. Or just literally they think somehow a person who jumps a turnstile in New York City in the subway is uh, a victim and, and therefore shouldn't be prosecuted. Uh, what, what's their justification? Two, two rationales. First, they want to reduce incarceration. Now, one should distinguish between incarceration in a prison and incarceration in a jail. People go to jail there for a couple of days until their cases come up and then the judge usually releases them. People who are in jail for months are there because they're about to be sentenced or they have been sentenced for a long, for a serious crime, and they're going to be going off to prison to serve the rest of their time. So you have to differentiate jails and prisons. And apparently the prosecutors, these prosecutors uh, believe that jail also contributes to incarceration, which of course it does. Uh, and we can reduce mass incarceration by keeping people out of jail. And that's rationale number one. But as you said, of course, that should be a decision for the legislature and not for individual prosecutors. That's a different issue. The second argument that Mr. Bragg made, uh, and he published all this, by the way, I wrote an article criticizing him and uh, all the information was right there because he published his views and explained them. His second argument is race, that, that uh, African-Americans are disproportionately uh, arrested for these crimes and therefore they're disproportionately incarcerated. Um, they may, that may be true, uh, but you, you can't tell if it's racism unless you look at the behaviors, unless you see whether they commit more, cri more crimes of this nature than non-Blacks. So you, you, he jumps to the conclusion, you know, that it's, that it's race bias, but I would not jump to that conclusion uh, at all. You have to see what the propensity to commit those crimes is. And, and unless you know that, you can't say that uh, it's race bias. So those are his two big arguments. You can reduce incarceration, and especially you can reduce uh, Black incarceration. So it, yeah, the, the issues then seem, to, well, they're similar up here in the sense that the focus then is now on the offender, uh, the potential person, the person who might potentially be convicted of a crime. The yeah. focus is more on them than the actual victim of yeah. the crime. And then yeah. second, people are very sensitive about race issues and, and, and those sorts of issues these days. Sure. And the parallel up here is uh, the overrepresentation in quotes um, in, yeah. in, in the prison system here of indigenous Canadians. Uh, this yes. forgets, uh, you make this point though in your book, this forgets though who the victims are uh, in both cases. You're not familiar with the indigenous Canadians example I just gave, but uh, the victims of um, Indigenous men are most often their spouses, their girlfriends. Sure, uh, sure, women. absolutely. So, so who, same thing in the United States. Um, yeah. Now, but let, let's jump actually away from Black Americans and, and Indigenous you know, Canadians on this file uh, mm -hmm. for a moment. Um, there are, uh, 
I, I hate the word minorities because I'd rather look at people as individuals. Uh, nonetheless, you're right. You have to kind of look at groups to study group behavior. So um, there are proportions of minorities in the United States who have very low crime rates. Uh, can you speak to that briefly? Uh, because that again speaks to what we talked about a moment ago, a little bit ago, uh, the power of culture, the, co the, the power of belief, right? Whether it's between two black American cohorts or I'm thinking of East Asian Americans that uh, most cohorts yeah. have very low are rates of crime vis-a-vis yeah. say white Americans. I mean, let, let's yeah. take just, uh, you know, the, the, what did you talk about? The, uh, the rednecks, the American mm -hmm. rednecks in the American South historically with, with high crime rates vis-a-vis -vis, say, um, East Asian, those of East Asian ancestry in the United States. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the differences there? Because I think that again yeah. speaks to the power of culture and, and belief. It Norms. was a fascinating study just came out, Mark, showing that in New York City in 2020, that was the year they studied, the uh, Asian population had more people below the poverty line than the Black population in New York. Fascinating. And I said, gee, that's very interesting. And I quickly checked and I was able to secure data, police data on arrests for serious crimes in New York in 2020 by race and ethnicity. And what did I find? I found that the Asian population had a much lower arrest rate for serious offenses than the African-American population the Hispanic population, and one or two cases, even the, the, the white population that was not Hispanic. And I said, wow, isn't that fascinating? Here's a population with relatively high, much higher than we would have thought, relatively high poverty rates, but quite low violent crime rates. So that flies in the face of what usually is believed to be the case. Here's a group with a lot of poverty and low rates of violent crime. So why is that? You know what my answer is going to be, right? The culture of these groups is what prevents the criminality. Their culture does not involve a great deal of, of violence. And that's why we have relatively low crime rates, even though there is a lot of poverty in this group. So this absolutely fascinated me. And so uh, the groups in go ahead, uh, please. the East Asian groups in New York City that you're talking about. So I assume there would also be plenty of recent immigration, right? Because historically, East Asian Americans have done very well in terms of. Income. Yes. So there must be as part of this cohort that you looked at, the averages must be um, must be lower in, in part because of, you know, if you're a newer immigrant from, say, mainland China versus. Um, third generation Taiwanese American or Korean American or Japanese American, your, your incomes are much higher. But even yes. among the groups that are more recent, say, emigrates to the United States from East Asia, you're finding that the crime rates are low despite, uh, uh, despite low incomes, right? And therefore, well, the economic foundation argument is, is again, broken. Yeah. So the link is yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, they didn't differentiate either the, the groups. And I, I don't even like the word Asian, to tell you the truth, because you have, again, diverse cultures. Uh, Filipinos are not Japanese, are not Koreans, are not Chinese. They're all quite different. Averages cultures. and generalities. That's, that's the problem with averages and generalities. Yeah. Grant yeah. You. So, I, you know, I'm not keen on, on that term Asian, but that's the one the census uses. That's the one that sociologists usually uh, use. They also didn't differentiate, as you just did the uh, timeline of immigration, and that could be significant uh, as well. But anyway, having lumped them all together, it still was a striking result that you would have this population with, with a higher level of, of poverty than the African-American population, but yet much lower uh, crime rates. Okay. It was fascinating to me. Um, our time has just whizzed by. It's a cliche, wow. but it's true. Can you briefly talk about the remedies um, in your book? Because uh, in the myth of our punishment at the end, uh, you do look at, first of all, you, you bust some myths about incarceration rates in the United States, but you talk about decarceration possibilities and what you call e-carceration. Uh, can right. you explain um, a little bit about there and where you think policy, public policy in the United States yes. go? Yes. I think the United States, with its advanced technological capacity is not making very good use of technology in the criminal justice field. Uh, 
and we can. Some of the European countries are doing m much better than, than we are. Scandinavian countries, Israel, uh, even in the European continent. I think we could, we could and should use the ankle bracelets more. I think we should use the tracking information more. And we should start with people who are paroled. Now, parole is when you release from prison. Assuming that the people who go to prison have done very serious crimes, and I think that's absolutely the case, uh, you, we should know that 83% of those who are released from prison before their terms have been served end up being arrested for another offense. 83%, Mark. This is a staggering figure. Four fifths. <clears throat> yeah. So I say, let's track these people. Uh, let, let's make them wear the bracelet, which will remind them they have to report to their parole officer and remind them that we know where they are. Unfortunately, we can't know everything that they're doing, but the technology might develop to a point where we can do better even on that score. Sorry, and, can you explain, explain again how this works and how other countries use it more effectively than the United States? Because so you've got an ankle bracelet, you're out of prison, yeah. you this ankle bracelet on. How would that necessarily dampen your ability, desire, likelihood? Uh, I mean, if you've, you know, if you've robbed, you know, 25 times before, um, perhaps you can still get away with it in time number 26, even with a bracelet yes. on your ankle. Uh, yes. So why would an ankle bracelet necessarily this, this E, uh, this E approach is E carceration approach, as you call yes. it, make any difference? Yes. Well, it depends on the offense. Uh, for instance, let's say the offender, the criminal, uh, has uh, abused his uh, a, a girlfriend. We can, we can actually demarcate the area where the girlfriend lives and where the girlfriend works, and perhaps where her children uh, go to uh, school. And this would be a no-go zone for the offender. And if he violates these boundaries, that would be immediately reported perhaps to the police or at least to the parole uh, officials, the parole officers, who can then do something about it. So this would be a deterrent because he would know that his uh, approach of these areas, these uh, geo-coded no-go zones, he would know that that's gonna be red flagged immediately to the authorities. And that would be a deterrent for him. Let's say he's a sex offender, and especially one who has offended with children. Presumably, schools and playgrounds would be no-go zones for him. Those would be uh, geo-demarcated as no-go zones. And again, the, the authorities would, would immediately be notified by the ankle bracelet if he violated those uh, boundaries. So it doesn't work for all crimes. Uh, as, as I say, the biggest shortcoming is it doesn't tell us exactly what he's doing at any given time. Uh, but we might be able to see that technology developed in, in the future. After all, uh, the progress has been tremendous in this field, and uh, I think it will continue to, to uh, advance. So I'd like to see much more use of technology uh, with starting with parolees, but then moving perhaps to people put on probation uh, as well. Uh, and the United States is way behind with this, way behind. Uh, Which countries much, in particular are you thinking of that are further ahead than the United the States? The Scandinavians are, the French are, uh, even the English are, are, are using this uh, more and more. Now, why is this? First of all, state... it's cheaper than incarcerating them, right? If you could deter m misbehavior, then you don't have to put him back in, in the jail or prison. And that's better for him. And it's better for our pocketbooks as so well. It's, it's not even a budget issue necessarily, at least at the, the long term. It's, uh, it's what, just they haven't gotten around to it in various uh, jurisdictions in the United States of implementing That's part of it. Or, or short term that's... budget issue where they don't want to make the upfront cost or investment. I, I... I think also the, they're afraid the courts will strike it down here. We have Fourth Amendment issues, search and seizure issues, and we've already had some unfortunate state court decisions uh, 
which I discuss in the book briefly, uh, which are uh, very negative. Uh, they say, well, this is a, an intrusion, it's a search and seizure, and, and, and so it is, <laughs> but so is being in prison. Uh, if you say, if I give you a choice, Mark, listen, I'll let you out of prison if you wear this around your ankle, which would you choose? I mean, that's what the real option is, more imprisonment or freedom with an ankle bracelet. And sure, it's an intrusion, but under American law, someone who is released to parole can be subject to all sorts of intrusions, and the Supreme Court has upheld them. Uh, they can go into your house without a warrant. They could stop you on the street and search you because you're a parolee. So you're still under the custody of the criminal justice system, uh, even though you're not in the uh, in the prison. So there are all sorts of limitations, and this would just be an, another one. But this would be helpful, I think, even to the defendant. It would discourage him from committing more crimes, and and therefore it would help him turn his life around. The notion that just job training and drug programs alone can do it has been uh, refuted, if not debunked. But this could really help. This could really help uh, uh, straighten out an, uh, an offender. And it beats more imprisonment by a country mile. So an ankle bracelet has the uh, inducement, kind of a little bit of a stick in addition to the carrots that are offered in terms of job training and the rest of it. Well, thank you, Dr. Latzer. Um, I wish we had more time. This is terrific. Thank you for taking the time. And I wish you all the success in this book. I just want to remind people we've been talking with Professor Barry Latzer, uh, Professor Emeritus of Criminal Justice John Jay College um, at the City University of New York as part of our interviews with a contrarian series. Um, last words to you, Barry, and then I'll just uh, do the extra here for myself. Um, your new book is, is The Myth of Overpunishment. Uh, again, this, this subtitle, The Defense of the American Justice System and a Proposal to Reduce Incarceration While Protecting the Public, and it's just released by Republic Book Publishers. If you had to give a 30-second elevator talk to someone, how would you describe your book? I think it's a refutation of the mass incarceration movement. And if, if I were a reformer, I'd want to know what's in this book, too, because to properly address the issues one has to be familiar with the circumstances and the situation in the jails and prisons today. And I think I provide that in a way that's easily understood. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Professor Barry Latzer. Uh, I'm Mark Milkey, Executive Director of the Aristotle Foundation of Public Policy and a think tank that's getting set up here in Canada. This book, though, is available in uh, Professor Latzer's other books are available not only in Canada, but of course, the United States, if you're watching there in all the usual online outlets and uh, your local bookstore, uh, which do want to carry on occasion still carry real books. So thank you all for watching. Thank you, Dr. Latzer, and look for another interview with a contrarian soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I enjoyed it immensely.